So tonight we're looking at <coughs> living Christ, loving all. Living Christ by loving all. But our series, and it's not, not even really a series that I've been working on for the last several weeks here, is that we, we were looking at living Christ. What does it mean to live Christ? Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives within me. And that launched us into what does it mean to live Christ? And we went through different scenarios of like living Christ facing temptation, living Christ facing trials. Last week was living Christ for others. We got into competition. And this is kind of like a part two to last <coughs> week because the motive behind um, no, no competing must be love. That's the only way to do it is, is by love. And we're going to talk about that, what it means to um, love all. And you'll see that that is um, not the nature of man. And until he awakens to his true identity, and then he knows that that's who he really is, because Christ is agape love, and we're partakers of his divine nature. But I want to start off again with 2 Timothy 3, because a lot of times these types of messages um, don't go over well, because we're used to encouragement, you know, feel good, and when you have a message like this that's really um, challenging us, um, when we get off the beaten path a little bit, I like using this scripture here. It says, Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So when we go to the Bible, it, it, it will at times reprove us, correct us, instruct us in righteousness and that's what we're going to do uh, we're going to let the scriptures do that for us um, tonight Romans 14 7 we looked at this one last week for none of us lives to himself so God did not create us so that we would be doing everything just for us but that um, and no one dies to himself so basically we are a body fitly jointly fitted together for one another for encouraging one another. And then we looked at this scripture, the next one. And here's where we're going to start from. Well, we'll do this one here. Ephesians 4.16. From whom the whole body jointly fitted together. And um, one joint supplies. According to the effect of working. By which every part does its share. So not one part's isolated. No one Christian's isolated. For a many member body coming together. For working by which every part does its share. Causes growth of the body. For the edifying of itself, and it's done in love, because that's that's you can't do this outside of love. If you do this outside of love, then the motive's wrong. You're probably doing it for ambition or to be seen or for gain of some sort. And then the next verse: Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. And here's where we looked at: Let each person, let each one in that body that's jointly fitted together. Let each one esteem the other better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interest of others. And I shared with you last week how I um, tried that as a young person on some people that were very braggadocious and one-upmanship and all that. And when I read this part here, I might have been like 18 or 19 years old, but when I read this part here, let each esteem others better than himself. And, um, and I thought, so I, from what that's saying, I'm supposed to treat people and be, treat them and, and esteem them that there's no competition, you already win because I see you better than me. And I said, wow, now that's, that's so I, I thought, I'll do this on these people. It changed, it changed everything. But I didn't do it out of love. I didn't love them. I did it because I thought, I did it because it said to do it. Love will come later down the road if it wasn't there now. And so what I didn't say last week is that we could do this, but it has to be done in love. Let love be the motivating factor that you really truly believe that those people, that other people are better than yourself. And that will fix, I'm telling you, that will fix so much that's wrong in the church because you, you can't do this outside the church that, because they don't know who they are they don't know the nature of God that um, is, is that they're one with 
So they're living a, another life that is illusion, it's filled with narcissism, self-interest, me, 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 that type of thing. And so um, it's hard to do that when everybody's in competition. Now America is built on competition. Corporations compete, athletes compete, um, academics compete, everything competes, compete, compete. And then when you get a job, it's competing against the other person. And so my question was last week, is with this with this scripture and there's, there was others we looked at but is there any place for competition in the kingdom of God I'm not talking about the world system I'm talking about in the kingdom of God is there any place for competition and so I want to look at some more scriptures but it, and I'm really not talking about competition it's going to go further than that but I want to talk about the motivation of everything has to be that love and you'll see you, you wait till you, you see these scriptures that how, how, and I know you know these scriptures, but how we're bringing them together um, today. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And um, let's see, verse 25. Luke 10, uh, verse 25. Give me a second to get there. Everybody there? All right, now watch this. A certain lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test, asking or saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law, and how does it read to you? And he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. So love the Lord your God and then love your neighbor as, as yourself. I mean, just we'll, we'll get into that here. Hold on. Verse 28, And, and he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But putting, but wishing to justify himself, now this is the, the lawyer, but wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, just wait there for a second, and let me explain something to you about the leadership, the church, which we they called the Pharisees. They owned the temple, they owned religion, they owned Judaism, they owned everything, they took it over. Now, first of all, the, the um, Pharisees were established around 167 to 160 BC, and not in your Bible, but in the Catholic Bible, in the Bibles years and years ago, um, they had the Apocrypha, and they had all these different Bibles that are uh, books in the Bible that they'd taken out during the Reformation, um, sometime during that. But anyway, but in that you you probably recognize the the two books, the Mac, first Maccabees, second Maccabees, and like I said, that that's that is a 400 year period um, between um, Malachi and. Matthew, there's like this 400 silent years, they say, and then you've got a lot of the books that were written during that time. They're history books. The Maccabees are one of them. And that's why we're looking at 167 before Christ to 160 years before Christ. So when Christ came on the scene, this group called the Pharisees had been established for about that long. They started off, and the word Pharisee means separatist. They wanted to separate from evil. They wanted to separate from everybody else because that's really what God told them to do in the Old Testament, not to mingle with other countries, but to be separate. And so they wanted to be holy, they wanted to be separate. But you can see by the time that Jesus showed up, this, this had become really bad. They, very traditional, men tradition, legalistic. They, they cared more about the law than people. They didn't love. There's no way they loved. They loved the law, but didn't love people. And one of the things you'll find out if you have it when we were looking at the Jesus perfect theology is that when Jesus comes on the scene they think he's breaking the law but he's just loving people 
that the law won't bend for. For instance, the woman caught in the act of adultery. The law says the stoner. Well, he loves her. The law is not going to help her. So they're all about, they, they would have been happy to see a stoning that day. There's no love there. But Jesus says, you know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So the motive for God, or they got mad because he healed on the Sabbath. But they could take a donkey and help their neighbor take a donkey out of the mud or a cow or whatever, but they, they, don't, they didn't like the fact that he healed on the Sabbath. So Jesus would, would take the law and not promote it to the degree that it was hurting people. These guys, separatists, was hurting people. So this was a common debate among the Pharisees, who's my neighbor? And because you're not going to love people that you've separated from, right? Now, I, w I want to be fair here, is that though the Pharisees, the, the term means separatists, and they separated. Now, but Paul tells us to come out from among them and what? Be separate. Be separate. And Paul tells us not to be unequally yoked. So there is a separation in the world, even among Christians. Let me give you an example. And it doesn't have to even be Christians. We have a separation. Let's put it this way. Let's say you go to work. I don't care where you work. If you don't, if this does this scenario doesn't fit you, then think of a job that you'd have that it would. But you go to work, and afterwards everybody's going to go to the bar, and they say we're getting drunk. We are going to just party. And you're like, I don't. I, I ain't doing that. Oh, come on, man. What's wrong with you? Are you better than us? Come on. Because everybody doesn't like when someone doesn't partake, right? And you're like, well, no, I'm not. I'm not better than you. That's just, that's not what I want to do. And then maybe the next weekend they're going to go to the horse, tr the, 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 the dog track, and they're going to bet. And like, I don't want to do that either. Everything these people, co-workers you're working with, they're into things you're just not, not because you're better. It just is not what I want to do. This is not how I live anyway. Are you not separating? Are they, no, are they going to see this separating? So just by natural choices and values and morals that we, whether we're Christians or non-Christians, we all have values and morals that put us around people of like mind, like moral, like value. Is, is that fair? So to a degree, I understand I'm not separating because I hate you. I'm not separating because I'm judging you. I'm not separating because I'm condemning you. I just don't do what you do. And I don't go to the places you go. And what's end up happening? We just end up hanging around people of like mind, right? Well, the Pharisees may have started out like that. We'll give them, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt that we, we just don't worship heathen idols. We don't sacrifice our children to Molech. We don't, we don't do these things. So we're coming out from among them. And understand, too, they're under the Old Covenant, so we don't, we're not mixing with other races because God wanted it, didn't want it that way up to a point. All the stuff. So there was probably a, 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 a good motive in, in, in separating. But by the time that Jesus comes on this scene, man, they're hard. And they've separated not only from everybody, but they've even separating amongst themselves and hating people because of the way they looked at them and the way they thought of them. It got down to the point that they would divorce their wife if she burnt the food. So they'll separate, they were separating from their wives. They're separating from people who don't agree with their theology, the way they interpret the law. It got to a place where they were separating, and the only people that they could stand was each other. And everybody else, they, they would spit on tax collectors. They wouldn't touch dead people or lepers, because that's according to the law. But they just wouldn't, they were not revered in a good way, because they've separated from everybody. They, they wanted that. They loved the fact that they were different. And, but they looked down the nose at everybody. That's, so when they ask the question, when this guy asked the question to Jesus, who's my neighbor, this was a, this was a huge thing with, with, with the, with the um, 
Pharisees because if I don't agree with you theologically, you're not my neighbor. I don't have to love you. And if I see you going out there doing this, that, that I don't do, you're not my neighbor, and I don't have to love you. They, they, were, they were separating themselves so much, they only loved each other. If you were a Pharisee, you got love from another Pharisee. But if you were a tax collector, a fisherman, a prostitute, a woman, just being a woman, that's how much separation they went. And um, so, so when he asked this question, who's my neighbor, you can now understand what they're really saying. Surely you're not asking me to love prostitutes, tax collectors, drunkards. They're not my neighbor. And you might be living next door to one, right? So that's the question, just to let you know that. And um, so when they asked him, who's my neighbor? So what I want you to see here, that Jesus was nothing like them, a separatist. He didn't come to separate. He came to unite. Not to separate from people, but take on their humanity. I'm not only going to come and not separate. I'll come into you. You're into me. And I'll bring this whole thing together under one head. So there's no separate. He did not come in any way, shape, or form to separate. And they saw that. They, these separatists saw him hanging around the people they separated from. He was calling them their neighbor, his neighbor, but they wouldn't call them their neighbor. Does that make sense? So first of all, he included the Samaritans. I can't explain this to you. We don't have time, although we did deal with what, where the Samaritans came from and how the Jews saw. But you know that they would never walk through Samaria. A Jew would never walk through Samaria. They would go clear around. Waste time and effort and money and, you know, to go around because they're not going to go through. What does Jesus say? We must go to Samaria. Not only do they go through it, he stops and talks to a woman well. at the well. And, um, and you know that story. But to understand really a Samar a, what, what is a Samaritan, to understand that, you have to understand that the racism, even in there, it would be like the Samaritans would be the blacks back in the, the day of civil rights, and the Jews would be the whites. And there was that tension and racism that was between the two. And so no, it, it would be like Jesus talking to, well, let me just put a pause on that, because right after he says, who's my neighbor, he's going to give them a story. So you you're still there? Let's look at it. Verse 30. A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among rob robbers. Now this, this place was um, isolated and people got robbed a lot. You didn't want to go there alone. And so he's using this as an example. And this guy gets um, robbed. And they um, stripped him and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. Okay? Verse 31. And by chance, a certain priest, that's one of these, of the guys that's lawyer, Sadducees, Pharisees, they're all scribes. And, um, and by chance, a certain priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed on by to the other side. Wouldn't even go even to check on him. Why? He's a Samaritan. Or he's... he's He's, um, what did it say he was? A, a certain man, okay? So this guy is a priest and won't go check him out. And likewise, a Levite. So we have a, pre, a priest and a Levite also when he came to the place and saw him pass by to the other side. But then here we come, a Samaritan. Now think of Jesus talking to a group of KKK and says... A white guy came by, a white lawyer came by, a white doctor came by, but a black man came by. Now would that, would that offend? We've got to put some flesh and blood on this, or these stories mean nothing to us. So when he uses a Samaritan, that is offensive. 
We don't mix. We don't talk. We don't even go to their town. We, don't, we, we ignore them completely. He says a Samaritan comes by. What's he do? Um, he was on his journey, and he came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and um, bandaged him up and so forth and so on. He takes care of him, in other words. So this is offensive number one. So who is my neighbor is the question. And so Jesus is trying to show them, you guys are divided. You guys are divided. And here's a Samaritan who's going to do something. They, they, he saw them as his neighbor. He did this out of what? Compassion. He bandaged them up out of compassion. And you guys don't see him as your neighbor. And you walk, you walk right by him. This is very offensive to them because, again, so were the Samaritans. Um, so this is, the, this is what Jesus is saying. Look, I'm going into Samaria. You guys don't because I see the Samaritans as my neighbor. I see this woman. You don't even go around women. I see this woman as my neighbor. And he's going to model who your neighbor is because that's the big debate amongst the Pharisees and others. Who is my neighbor? Because if I can get out of loving and helping and, and just my own, my own group, that's what we really want to do anyway. What's he say? Love your enemies. Don't love those who love you. What, what, how, do you how do you prove love that way? If you want to prove love, love your enemies. Again, he's showing them enemies are, his, are their neighbors. You see how, why, why I call this um, living Christ loving all? Not just a group, not who you like or who maybe a, others have marginalized because if I marginalize a group of people, I obviously don't see them as my neighbor and I don't have to love them. I see them as my enemy. I ain't loving my enemy. But the church is part of this problem as well. So watch this. Jesus was not a separatist. And he goes and models what, who your neighbor is. And he starts with the Samaritan woman. And then how about the, the woman who touched him with the issue of blood? Because you can't even go, you shouldn't even be out in public when you're bleeding. And so he's letting her touch the, his, him, of, him of his garment. And he doesn't even say anything about what the law says. She's not allowed to be here. Right? She's not allowed to be in public right now. She's bleeding. You got to go to a special place and hide out and be there till you till you till that dries up. But she's in the crowd. She's in the public. She touches. She he gets touched by a bleeder who happens to be a woman, and he turns around and says, "Who touched me?" She's probably freaking out because she's not supposed to be there, and she's a woman, and she just touched him, his clothing. If that was a Pharisee, you can imagine. He would unleash on her. Jesus didn't do that. How about Zacchaeus? He's, he's walking down there. Pharisees are spitting on him. Jesus comes and says, I'm coming to your house for dinner. See, they've excluded tax collectors. He's going to have one as a disciple, Matthew. He's including them. He's showing, he's modeling to them that culture, Jewish culture, the Pharisees especially, who your neighbor is everybody's your neighbor okay so how about Mary the prostitute remember the Pharisee said if this man who claims to be a prophet knew what kind of woman this was touching his feet he wouldn't have her be doing it because as a Pharisee that woman ain't coming around me let alone touch my feet the prostitute is Jesus neighbor and remember Love your neighbor as yourself. These guys, no way in the world could they love a tax collector like they love themselves. He didn't even say love your enemy, or he didn't say um, love your neighbor as your mom or as your dad. Because even then you'd have to say, I gotta, I gotta love that prostitute like I love my mom. We love ourselves better than we love everybody. That's why he goes for the juggler. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, you might love your mom, you might, but not like you love yourself. You'll do more. You, you'll sacrifice more for you than you will even your own family members. Okay. So then he did it with adulterers. 
He did it with lepers. Um, Jesus modeled who your neighbor was. And Jesus was showing these people the same love that God had for him. Think about that. For God so loved the world. He loves his son. He loves the world. And it's the same exact love. And that's what Jesus modeled. Now in um, John 15. Do I have John 15 9? I may, I may not. No. Okay. But it's on your outline. Listen to what John 15 9. I think this is the translation. A passion translation. I love each of you with the same love that the Father loves me. Again, you, you got to really sit this thing through. So Jesus has got a prostitute at his feet. He's having dinner with a tax collector. He let, a pro, he let an adulterer go free. And why? Because he was modeling the same love that God had for him, he was showing to them. And again, they're not my neighbor and I don't have to love them. No, nope. everybody's your neighbor. All people are your neighbor. He came for all. Jesus came for all. Um, so love one another extends to love your enemies. Love is the motive for all things as it is with the Godhead. Everything that God does is out of love. Nothing else. It is out of love. Okay? Love would never compete with another. Love would never make another feel less than. Love covers a multitude of sin. Love takes the wrong suffered. Love forgives. Love never fails. There's all kinds of scriptures for that. Now I want to take you to another one. Mark chapter 10. Turn there in your Bibles. Mark chapter 10. Love is going to esteem the other better than yourself. You will, you, you, you love that person more than you, or as much as you love yourself, but you'll esteem them better than you. That's the Philippians 2. But look now, let's go to, um, what did I say, Mark chapter 10. Now watch this, Mark chapter 10. And let's start at verse... 35, verse 35, where are we at? And James and John, these are the sons of Zebedee, they, they were called the sons of thunder. James and John, these are the two that wanted to rain fire down from heaven because that city wouldn't accept Jesus. These two guys, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus comes back and says, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant that we may sit in your glory, one on your right and one on your left. And Jesus says, You do not know what you're asking. And then he'll go on and say, Are you able to drink the cup? But drop down to verse 41. I just only want to stick with what's pertinent here tonight. Drop down to verse 41. And hearing this, Hearing what? The other ten heard these two ask Jesus to be on the right and left in his kingdom. And hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. Does anybody have anything different than indignant in your translation? Displeased. Displeased? Displeased? There's, there's others. Indignant. Indignant. So, um, right there's division. They're already, they're already, they're already, they're divided. And why? They're, why they, these two are in competition with the other ten. And it doesn't even dawn on him. Hey, he only has a one right and one left. And we're brothers. Let's go sneak away and ask Jesus if we can have a position the others can't have. Well, they heard it. And they became indignant. How does Jesus... Jesus, this is, this is volatile here. This, this is... Con, you know, he says a kingdom divided can't stand. If he can't keep 12 disciples on one page, united in love, how's, it, how's he going to do the rest of the body of Christ down the road? How's he going to answer this? Where did I leave off at? Verse 41. Let's look at verse 42. And calling them to himself. Okay, guys, we've got division. We've got competition. This, this, is, not, this is not love. 
This is not what I came to do. Now look what he says. He said to them, you know that the Gentiles, um, he, he says, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. He said, but it is not so among you. This doesn't happen in the kingdom. Okay? But whoever wishes to become great, okay? You want to rise? You want to be great in the kingdom? He says, you're going to have to become a servant. No competition there, is there? To be great, i got to compete. But in the kingdom to be great, there's no competition. I have to serve. And when you're serving, you're esteeming the person better than yourself. Hmm? He's, getting, he's, he's saying, this is not how we play it. This is not what we're doing. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, he's including himself, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now the same thing happens in Matthew 20. Now is this the same story, but told a little differently? We won't go there, we don't have time. But in this one, and I, don't, I, I, it's, it's, I guess you could say it's the same story. I'm sure most theologians will tell you that it is. But I find it interesting, and I'm not saying that it's not, but I just find it interesting that, that these guys, 12 guys are watching this, and, and um, Mark says the two boys, the two brothers came to Jesus, and then you go to Matthew, and Matthew says his mother with the two boys asked. So if we went to Matthew chapter 20, what you're going to find in that narrative is that the mother goes up to Jesus and says, Hey, will you do what I ask you to do? He says, What do you want me to do? I want you to put my boys on the right, one on the right and one on the left. So was it the two boys that came up to Jesus? Was it the mother? Or, or was it both? And just how these guys saw it was a little different. Um, neither, no matter the case, the response is the same. I can't do that. You don't know what you're asking. He says, we don't do that. That's, that's what the Gentile, what you're doing is what the world system. That's why he talks about Gentiles lording it and those who have authority over them. He's like, that's the world system. And that's what you do at work. That's what you do out there in corporation. He said, that's what you do in any um, organization. But he says, in the kingdom... This doesn't, this is, you, you can't bring that into the kingdom. It doesn't work that way. I don't even do it. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. How can we get to this place when we recognize that that's the nature of God in us is to serve and to love, not compete, and to love all? And to serve all, no matter what the color of the skin is, no matter what the class that they're brought up in. All right? Um, so they're, the, Jesus fixes this. But then again, let's talk about the love factor here. Jesus would pick 12 guys and love those 12 guys, even though one's going to steal from the treasury, even though one's going to deny him, and one's going to betray him, and the rest are going to forsake him. And he still picks them out and serves them, knowing... Now watch this, because I wrote this down. Um, loving them, not for what they could do for him. Because that would mean they would be serving him. He came to be served. Now look what I put down there. Loving them, not for what they could do for him. Because they're not going to do much for him. They're going to steal from him, they're going to deny him, they're going to betray him, and then ultimately they're going to forsake him. Loving them not for what they could do for him, but loving them in spite of what they will do to him. Think about that. Not what they could... I'm loving you because I know you're going to do me some... You're going to, you're going to do me some solids. You're going to be my friend. No, I'm going to love you in spite of what you're going to end up doing to me. Now, it's one thing to treat them this way, and then they do this stuff to him, and you're like, I didn't know that was in them. Hey, no, no, he already knew what was in them, 
when he chose them and when he loved them. He loved them knowing what they would do. He told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. He knew Judas was going to betray him. He knew that he told them, you guys are going to forsake me, but I will not be forsaken because my father will be with me. So he knew what they would do to him, but he loved them anyway. Today we separate over what people do to us and we unite with those who do things for us. And we get into, just look at the world today. There's class warfare, race warfare, political warfare. But let's look at the church. I was raised in a very good church. It was a healthy church. It, and when I use the word progressive, I don't use it in the, the definition today. But that we were growing and we were on the cutting edge of a lot of things. We were one, one of the largest churches in town. And um, we really had a... But... I was raised separate as a separatist in that you don't want to talk you don't want to go to the Catholics uh, you don't want to, they believe this and you don't want the Presbyterians because they believe that and those Methodists they don't even believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and these and, and I mean I knew the I knew we well, don't want to go to Church of Christ they, they think they're the only church and then they, you got to be baptized um, and you want to go to the holiness because you got to speak in tongues to be saved I mean, I, they, they had them all picked out what was wrong with each one and that you needed to stay away from them. That's how I was raised. I, I don't know about you guys. That's how I was. So what happens at that point, you become secluded and you become a cluster of yourself. You call, talk about an echo chamber. You just hear about what you believe and it's, it's just right there. And forget what, what they might have. They might have a piece of something that I need. And this group might have a piece. And I come to find out, the Lord, after I broke away from denominationalism, I found out all of them have a piece that I need to listen to and, and partake of and, and believe. And um, so you can see you're, we're raised being separatists simply because they don't believe like us. And if you go back further... I, I know um, I, I know some people of a different race that was in a large church, a growing church, and they were told you might want to go to another church where you're more with your own kind. What's that's separating? That's separating. And I'm gonna, I, I, I really want to drive this home. Jesus reached out to everybody. No matter what. How about the woman who was a Canaanite and she comes to Jesus and says, I need you to heal my daughter. And he said, uh, the disciple says, go away. And she wouldn't. And so Jesus says, I'm not giving um, bread to dogs. I came to the, to, to the Jew, not to the Gentiles. And, um, and she, she persisted. And he says, I can't give crumbs. I, I can't give, um, what did he say, dogs. Food to the food to dogs, and she says even the dogs eat off the, even the dogs eat the, the crumbs off the table. And he went, whoa, woman, your faith is great, and he healed the daughter. You know what happened there? He was giving her theology, and she wasn't having it. She was said basically what she was saying was, I don't know anything about this race warfare. Jews, Samaritans, um, Canaanites, and all your separatists, and, and all this, that. And you come to the Jew, and I, 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 you, I don't know your theology. Don't know your, all I know is my daughter is sick and needs to be healed. She's dying. That's, that's all I know. And if, and if you can throw me a couple crumbs, I'll take, I'll take whatever you can give me. And there's a lot in that story you could do with. But the thing is, G Jesus was, was, I don't know if he was, I don't want to say playing with her or testing her, but he was just, I, for whatever reason, that's how he was approaching her. Okay? And um, she, she, was, she was determined to have her daughter healed in spite of the theology and the separation and everything that was going on from the Old Covenant. So, um, again... This is, this, this is Jesus' style. It would include everybody, and everybody who came to him, 
even that guy, the centurion, that they couldn't stand because these were the guys that were in their neighborhoods with M16s, if you will, and, and watching every move they make because they were under Rome occupation. And they, these people, we, you wouldn't like that if there were Russians over here or Chinese over here watching every move because we were under their, their heavy hand and you only had so much freedom and, so, and they limited you and they made you walk mile with them, took your coat, everything you see <laughs> happening there. And yet one comes to Jesus and says, well, my daughter or my servant is sick. And he honors the faith of that guy. And it's like, Jesus, you don't go with where... Uh, this, this is the guy that, that politically is crushing us as a people? And you're doing him a solid? Because he was modeling who his neighbor was. They didn't... They really didn't know who's my neighbor. They were only treating certain class people, certain style people, certain, certain belief system as their neighbor. Heck, we knew that the Presbyterians and the Methodists and the Episcopalians and the, and the, and the um, Catholics and the Orthodox, well, we knew they were, you know, they were part of the church, but not a part of our church. It just it doesn't make any sense. You, they never looked at each other as united in love. And, um, and maybe still even not today. I don't know. I, I can only answer for myself and maybe who we are as a church here. So, Matthew 7, 12. I'm going to hurry up here. Matthew 7, 12. You know, if, if, if this is considered the golden rule, if everybody did this, I, I, I don't think the mind could comprehend the change that would happen in families, in marriages, in churches, and in, in, in the United States and around the world. If, if this really was our heartbeat, our conviction. Look what he says here, Matthew 7, 12. So in everything, everything, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So in other words, how do you want that person to treat you? Then you treat them the way you want them to treat you. What do you want people to do for you well, then you do for others what you want them to do for you. So if you committed a, a, a heinous sin, what would you want? You would want people to forgive you. Well, then you forgive those who commit sins like that. Or all sins. So I've heard this, and this has to be God. But I'm about to tell you, has to be God. Because too many people are saying it, and God said it to me years ago. Years ago. I am, no, I, 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 I am not one of those drivers that ride your rear end. Um, I, I'm not a hostile driver, though I used to be, not because I'm mean and angry, I'm always in a hurry. Just always go, 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 go. And that makes me just do all... And then when I get behind somebody who's going really slow, I'm like, come on, come on, come on. You've been there, right? I'm not nowhere near that anymore. That's, I'm saying that's me in my 20s and 30s. But around my, my 40s, I am giving this old lady everything I can think of and even probably a few ch um, choice cuss words because this is just ridiculous. Nobody needs to be driving this slow. And I am just irritated. And then God says to me, if that was your mother, how would you want the guy behind her to treat her? <coughs> if that was your mother, would you be doing this? You'd be like, no, nah, she's old. She's getting old, man. That's just... So you want to back off because that's your mother. You wouldn't do that to your mother if you were following her home. And then I thought, wow, you know, let's take that. What if that was your wife? Would you want a guy flipping your wife off? You want a guy honking the horn, you know, and waving the hands and, you know, just making her feel like crap? Because, or maybe she pulled out in front of somebody. Maybe your wife pulls out in front of somebody and some guy, do you want him giving her what for or do you want him to show her mercy and grace because she made a mistake? And then even just recently, well, not recently, but within the last five or so years, um, 
I started thinking, well, who's in front of me? Is it my dad, which is an old person? Is it my mom, an old person? Is it my wife in front of me? Or is it my son who's just learning to drive? Do they really need some hothead behind them, honking the horn, doing things with the car, and freaking the young kid out, and there's a new driver? I'm thinking, and then, you know, maybe 10 years after that, God starts saying, well, you start driving with grace. And just give grace to everybody. Unmerited favor. They don't deserve letting you in. And, but, so this whole thing. But the reason I say I know this is God, I've heard so many times over the last 20 years, people saying that God told them the same thing about driving. And who knew that driving would be... You think they drive bad here? When we went to Florida for three weeks in Orlando and drove down... I, I saw things I would never see up here. And I'm like, oh my God. I thought we drive insane. I can imagine L.A. driving through, which we did back clear in, what, 2003. But there was road rage going on back in 2003 when we were out there for a couple of weeks. But I'm telling you, it's, we gotta, I, I, it, society knows no grace or mercy. But that's who Jesus is. And if the church can't model who my neighbor is, where are we at? The guy you're behind driving is your neighbor. The guy that pulls out in front of you, maybe even blatantly pulls out, he's your neighbor. No, I can flip him the bird because he's not my neighbor and he's not my friend. And look what he just did. No, he's your neighbor. Are you getting this? Is this making sense? So if we would start treating people like Jesus said, the way that we want them to treat us, this turns the tables. This, this is a game. This is a stinking game changer if it could get any grip within the hearts of in the lives of people. It really is. Because we wouldn't, we wouldn't do things for people or things to people. That if we start, do I want them? Would I want them to do that to me? Even on a smaller basis of um, where you don't, you don't have to. It's not that they're even being mean. It's it's them like, I, do I really want to go the extra mile? Well, do you want somebody to go the extra mile for you? Now this could this could wear you out. <laughs> this could literally wear you out because everybody needs you. I get that. But this is where you're, you're not led by um, self-interest. You're not led by narcissism or I'm not sacrificing. That's not where we want to be led by the Spirit. And when the Spirit says, hey, you need to do that, well, then you, you're already there. You already know you want to do it. You should want to do it. But now you say, okay, Lord, is this, what, is this something that you... Because otherwise, if you gave to everybody that asked, you'd have no money, right or wrong. If you did everything everybody wanted you to do, you'd have no time for anything. So, and, and, and the way this society is, once somebody sees you as a target of niceness, they're all going to ascend on you for help. And then what are you going to do? You, you, you're, 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 you can't help everybody. You can't. You can't. I think even this lends to where Paul says, I forget where it's at, in one of his letters, he says, you know, help everybody, but make sure first those in the household of God are being helped first. Because if you help everybody, and then people in your own church that you're jointly fitted together in, where there should be body ministry and help and everything, the widows, everything he tells us to do for one another, that has to be workable within. And if everybody on the outside is taking every, your resources and your time and everything, well, you, you, that's why Paul says, let's just make sure that, you know, be that, yeah, but make sure people in the household. And then he says, look out for other interests your, as well as your own. Let's go back to Philippians 2. You guys got to see this. Because you can come under condemnation and that's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to just bring you some sense here. Um, um, Philippians chapter 2. Look at this. Um, Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, so he's saying, look out for your own interests. In other words, save enough money to pay your bills. Don't pay everybody else's. And then when you come home, lights out. No water. Where's my car? Well, they came and got it. Because you paid somebody else's. 
I mean, you got to, you, you, there's common sense here, but also mostly being led by the Spirit. There's nothing wrong with looking out for your own interests, but also for the interest of others. So, you know, anyway. So, treat others the way you would want them. Um, the only way is the way of love. What did Jesus say? Father, forgive them. He's on the cross. He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And what is he doing? He's modeling the love God has. Because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father is loving these people while they're crucifying his son. Now, Jesus couldn't say that. For God so loved the world, and that world's going to crucify him. He loved them. He couldn't, Jesus couldn't say, Father, forgive them, had he not had that love relationship with the Father himself. A lot of the disconnect that's happening within the, definitely in the world, but even in, amongst the church, is that we have not had an awakening to the love of God. And you can't give what you haven't received. received. Now watch. Let me close with this. Uh, Ephesians 3.18. Look at this. Paul's prayer. May he's, he's, Paul doesn't break his sentences up uh, uh, much. They, they go on. So we got to cut in on this may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide, that you would grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep the love of God is. So that you would know, you'd get a revelation of this love. Next verse, Romans 5.5. 5. This love, by the way, that he says that you, would, that you would see and experience, has already been what? Shed abroad in your hearts. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been shed abroad as the King James poured out into your hearts this is the this is the NIV has been poured out into your hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to you so the love is there don't say I can't no it's there you haven't tapped into it to manifest it it's there you can never say I can't love that person it's there it's been shed abroad in your hearts. Jesus modeled it, the love of the Father. And he said that love is in you. It's been shed abroad in you. Next verse. I in, this is Jesus in the, the high priestly prayer. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus says it right there. Everybody that he... Now, this is, this is John 17. He's going to be... Uh, this evening, he will be um, betrayed. So this is, this is the end of his ministry. And he says, I have loved them the way you loved me. That's, so that prostitute got the same love. Jesus was giving her his love... The same love he got from the Father, he gave to her. Now the disconnect is you. Are you getting the love of the Father? Do you have a revelation of that love that you can pass on to somebody else? If not, everything I said here, you will feel judged, you will feel condemned, and you will feel like, oh my God. No, the problem is, I want you to see, you, you have that ability. It is your nature to be this. It's just that the breakdown is you haven't received or it's already been given according to Romans 5.5. 5. So you've got to tap into that love that's there already. I'm not asking you to acquire that love so you can give it out. I'm telling you that love is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's been shed abroad in your hearts as he no longer I live but Christ who lives within me. That love is there. That love is there. you got to... Okay, let me give you another one. Let's put, put, put a pause on that. Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow what? Living water. Where do you get those living waters? Is there a store to go to? Do I have to go to a, a, a revival meeting? Is there a certain denomination who's given out this water? Is there a certain teaching that i got to know to get that water? Who's the source of the water? Christ is that rock. Water comes out of that rock in the Old Testament. Christ is that rock. Where is that Christ? Where is Christ in us? And out of Him in us flows that living water. It's there. 
It's not to be acquired. It's not to be bargained for. It's not even to be earned. It is there. There's a veil, I don't, and we have a disconnect. It's unbelief. It's the fact you don't know it. And once your eyes, this is why he said in Ephesians 3.18, that your eyes would be open, that you would know the height, the width, the depth, the length of God's love. Because it's there in you. You've got to ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes. And once you jump in that pool of love and bask in it and, and, and experience God's love for you, you just, you just manifest it to others. You won't even try. It just automatically, effortlessly flows. So don't see this as condemnation, judging, or something you got to be, something you got. No, you are this. You are this. And Jesus was, was it in the Gospels and comes into you and gives that love to you so you can give it to others. Does that make sense? All right, any questions or comments? And you can see now, why would I want to compete? And, and, and I'm, I'm not going to compete with people in the kingdom. I'm going to serve people in the kingdom. If they get better than me and bigger than me and higher than me, I've done my job. I had a guy when I was pastor and youth pastor and associate pastor of this big church, and we had a counselor on staff. And he came up to me and he said, look, my job is that if I can give you everything that I have, if I just pour into you everything that I have and that I know, and that you go off and you leave here or wherever God takes you, and you become more of a success than me, I did my job. And I'm like, man, that ain't where I've been from. That is not the group, and that's not the people that I grew up with. This is a different language I'm hearing. And I'm like, that's true, man. That, that, that resonates within me. And I've used that, well, that's been my, my way. If I can make you, give you everything, this is why I labor like this. If I can give you everything that I know, Everything I hear, I give it to you. I don't hold anything back unless the Lord says not yet, not, you know, timing. But I give you everything that I know. And if you can take it and you can become better and greater in the kingdom of God than me, I, I, I'm not competing with you. I'm esteeming you better than me. And if your, your calling is one that's greater than mine, what did John the Baptist say? I must decrease so that he can increase. Right? Is that what, because remember what they said, John, Jesus is baptizing more people than us now. We used to have the whole town come to us. But today, we don't have that. We don't have that today. He's got all the, he's got all the people. And John says, that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, it's, it, it, I must decrease so that he can increase. That's not John and Jesus. That's me and you. I'll decrease so that you can increase. Is that not what Philippians ends up saying? Esteeming you better than your... And looking out for the needs of others rather than your... Or as, as, as well as your own? Let this mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus. And if, like I said last week, we, I can't make this be for everybody, but at least in Fairmont and here, if we could do this, then let's do it. I mean, not if. We can do this if we're open, if our eyes are open to who we really are. Okay. I have a question. Yep. At the beginning, I just wanted to make sure I, I don't know if I heard you right or not, but when you were talking about what you're saying, we see ourselves, um, we see others better than ourselves. Um, I don't know if you, what did you say about people who aren't in the kingdom? Like we can't do, did you say we can't do that with people who aren't in the kingdom? Because that's what No, I, I, said, I said people that, people can't do this outside of the kingdom. Okay. That's a fact. Because they, 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 I, I grew up the first, I don't know how many years, that, you know, go back to that, Matthew seven twelve. Now this says, do unto others as you would want them to do to you. But I honestly was not in church. I was grew up a heathen. And I would quote this. Do unto others as they do unto you. And then when I got, you know, started going to church and I came, I said, that's not what that says. I, go, I, I really thought that might have been a scripture somewhere in the Bible. Do unto others as, as they do unto you. I really thought that was 
true. And of course, you do it to me, vengeance is mine, I'm going to do it back to you. And, you know, maybe harder. Or then, then, then the other one was do unto others before they do it to you. <laughs> you know? So no, what I'm saying is the world, they, they're, they, this is why we're, the world's in the shape that it's in. But when you come into the church and you see that that mentality has been brought into the church and the division and everything and the hate and the unforgiveness and the condemnation and the guilt, everything that the church is, is not love. And we're criticized to the, I mean, and, and rightly to be criticized. Because it's, we've never made it about love. And Jesus, this is all about love. And this is why they hated him and they crucified him. Because, the, because he chose love over law. He chose people over procedures. And they were all about the letter. And he was all about love. Anything else? Lord, let this mind be in us as it was in Christ Jesus. Open the eyes of our understanding and let us see the love of God, the height, the width, the breadth, the length of that love that is beyond anything that we can even imagine because why love never fails. Love never fails. Let us be people of love and everybody is our neighbor and therefore we love all. Amen.